<laughs> Amen. Uh, if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to be pulling that out and be turning to Galatians chapter 5. We'll be there in just a moment. Uh, if you came prepared uh, to give an offering today, uh, you are welcome to do that in a container in the foyer or if you give online. Uh, thank you for your continued generosity. Uh, a couple things just want to mention real quickly. Uh, today, uh, we begin another Catch the Vision class. And so if you're new to Homewood, that is just a, a way for you to get to know uh, our church a little bit, also to, to learn some opportunities that you can get involved in. It, it's also the, the class that we um, you know, invite you to place membership in. And so if, if that's something that you're interested in, uh, even if you didn't RSVP, you're welcome to come. Uh, I'll be leading that class today. It'll be upstairs right next to the elevator. Uh, so if you'll make your way up there immediately after service, uh, we'd love to, to greet you there. Uh, today we continue our series on the Holy Spirit, and we've been looking at these different uh, aspects of the Holy Spirit, how the, the, the Word of God talks about the Spirit of God uh, quite frequently, how Jesus uh, did everything uh, by the Holy Spirit. So we've talked about the presence of the Spirit. We actually did a, a biblical survey overview of, of kind of the whole uh, scriptures and how they, they point us to the presence of God's Spirit. That was week one, and then we talked about the power of God's Spirit, uh, the dynamite, uh, that Greek word uh, literally means, of the Spirit. And then we, a few weeks ago, talked about the promise of the Holy Spirit. Paul would say it's a, it's a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. And we talked about that a few weeks ago. And today, I want us to consider uh, the produce of the Spirit. And you'll notice they all, all start with peace, so hopefully you're kind of remembering all of the lessons of this series, but the produce of series, what do we mean when we say produce? Well, most of you are probably familiar with going to a grocery store and uh, walking into the produce section. I love a well-kept produce section. Anybody with me? I mean, because uh, you've probably seen some that aren't very well-kept. Uh, one of our members, uh, Curtis Webster, uh, worked uh, in a produce section at Food Giant up in Pinson for 31 years. And I can testify, I went there one day and I saw how neatly he kept that produce section. He told me this morning, he said, they don't keep it the way I kept, I kept it back in the day. They don't keep it like that anymore. And uh, so I'm grateful for a neatly kept produce section. Uh, I'm, I love fruit. Uh, I, I just, I love fresh fruit. I love eating fruit. Um, I even love fruit jokes. So, you know, every now and then we'll tell fruit jokes in my house. What's a vampire's favorite fruit? It's a nectarine. Of course it is, right? What do you get when you put an iPhone in a blender? Apple juice. Absolutely. What did the daddy melon say to his daughter melon's boyfriend? You cantaloupe, right? <laughs> hey, don't even, don't even explain that to your neighbor if they don't get it, all right? Just, just let that one go right over. Uh, did you hear the joke about the peach? It's pitiful, right? Pitted fruit. What happens to grapes when you step on them? Yes, they whine. Um, absolutely. That was right on cue. Thank you. Uh, today, Paul's going to talk about the produce. Uh, he's going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit. And this may be a phrase that we've, we've heard uh, for, uh, you know, maybe many years, maybe you haven't, but but this phrase, the, the fruit of God's spirit, the letter to the Galatians really exposes this, this conflict that's happening, that's taking place within the Galatian church. And Paul has spilled a good bit of ink addressing this conflict. And the conflict is, well, uh, is it Jesus or is it Jesus plus some of these things? Uh, particularly in the, in the context of Galatians, is it Jesus plus having to fulfill and do some of these things that are written in the Mosaic law. And even more particularly in the book of Galatians, it, it's referring to uh, circumcision. So you had these teachers that were saying, yeah, yeah, we're, we're going to talk about Jesus, but if you really, really want to be, you know, who you're supposed to be, then you also need to do these things as well. And Paul has some, some really serious things to, to say about that message and how he counters that message. So Paul doesn't just address this conflict within the church. Paul even moves to addressing this conflict within our souls. 
And so when, when he goes in, in chapter 5, if you'll follow along with me, Galatians 5, starting in verse 13, he says, you, my brothers and sisters, you're called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, rather serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour one another, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. I like how author and scholar Scott McKnight says it. He says, the, the problem of the Galatians is typically human. Egos enter into the debates between people, and before long, the issue is who is going to win. It becomes who is right, not what is right. So now we'll see Paul address the conflict or this battle that's happening within. Uh, move, move to verse 16. So, so I say, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit. And the spirit, what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. So that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, then you are not under the law. There's, there's two natures at work. And this is what Paul is describing. Two, two natures at work in, in every Christian. That the spirit and the flesh or the spirit and the sinful nature are at work against each other. So Paul says the two are really having this conflict. You ever had a conflict with somebody? You ever been in conflict with someone? What's the conflict? The conflict is between the, the two desires. These desires that are war, warring against each other. And so what's the big deal about conflict? Well, it's conflict that is going to either move us toward or move us away, keep us from living in the center of God's will. So Romans 7, 22 and 23, Paul says that in my inner being, I delight in God's law. Yet he finds and says that there's another law that's in work within me, waging war against the law of my mind. So Paul's been, been contending that a life and a faith in Jesus and in the spirit is characterized by freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from the law and freedom from its curse. And now he's applying this idea of freedom to this inner conflict that happens within, within the human heart. This war, this fighting of the flesh, is this, this Greek word called sarx. This is this, this conflict that's happening. Paul tells the Galatian church what the nature of the sarx includes, this earthly nature that's a, apart from the divine influence. So let's keep following along. Verse 19, the acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, here's what I want us to notice about, about that list. Because there's a lot of words in there that we don't, we don't use every day. But one of the things that you'll notice about this list is that some of these are actions, things that... That we do some of these are attitudes notice the actions notice the attitudes there's three words in verse 19 having to do with the works of the flesh in the area of sexuality this this first phrase sexual immorality it's the greek word pornania it's where we get the word pornography and, and it's sexual intercourse between unmarried people but we remember jesus's words who would even say you know i tell you that if you even look at a woman and lust after her you've already committed that act in your heart so jesus takes it even a step further impurity and debauchery which is uncontrolled sexuality and then there's two words in verse 20 having to do with the area of religion idolatry which is providing an inadequate substitute for god and then you see this word witchcraft which is the greek word pharmakeia which is where we get the word pharmacy. And my wife and others in this room don't really appreciate when I say that they're practicing witchcraft. <laughs> but this is, this is where we get that word. And it's, it's this idea of sorcery. It's probably uh, more in line with the faking the work of the spirit, possibly similar to Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter 8, who was, who was trying to buy the Holy Spirit. 
And he gets a, a pretty good rebuke uh, in Acts chapter 8. And then we see eight words that describe how the flesh, how this flesh destroys relationship. And I want you to notice here in these words, four of them are, are attitudes and the other four are a result of these attitudes. So just, just begin to examine yourself in these when it comes to these attitudes, selfish ambition, jealousy, envy, hatred. And then these, these attitudes that, that are, are, have results to them, like discord, divisions between people, outburst of anger. Are you catching these? And then lastly, there's two words that are referring to, to substance abuse. It's believed that drunkenness and orgies are, are actually linked, some scholars would say, meaning that, that orgies is more of a reference to drinking orgies rather than sexual ones. But, but the point being is that that one of the works of the flesh is addiction, being addicted to pleasure-creating substances and behavior. I'm grateful for programs and ministries like AA and Celebrate Recovery. I know of meetings that happen all over, all over this town every, every day of the week. I would encourage you to, to utilize those if those are are needed. But the last thing, this is, this is the flesh. And then the last thing that I, I want you to do this morning, or I want to do this morning, is really try to, try to oversimplify the sinful nature and, and offer unhelpful platitudes to them. It's not, not my task this morning, not what I'm trying to do. Yet Paul says that those who live in the sinful nature will not inherit the kingdom of God. And I really, I agree with Tim Keller on this one who says Paul is not looking to undermine Christian assurance here but he is aiming to banish complacency he's not looking to undermine Christian assurance we talked about that just a few weeks ago the promise the promise that you you can rest assured in but he's more referring to aiming to banish this complacency that could come along with that, we tend to be much better at noticing the works of others, the works of someone else's sinful nature, than we are at battling our own. Isn't that true? That we, we tend to, to see that more clearly in others. And so is it possible for the Galatian experience not to, to altogether be too different from our own? People have begun to devour one another in their desire for control and to, to be, you know, ex who they want it to be, you know, they, they, they just d begin devouring and seeking this, this control. And then how do I, as a Jesus follower, lay down my insatiable desire for control? What does Paul say? Paul says, walk by the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. Like th this is the path forward. And what does that mean? I mean, won't, won't, the Spirit calls me to do these weird kind of goofy things, but for Paul, the Spirit was that which enabled God honoring things. It's just the Spirit-fueled development of a Christ-like character, bringing us more in step with who we're designed to be, this imago Dei, the image of God, that we are image bearers of God. And this is who we were designed to be. So Paul talks about these two things. He talks about the acts of the flesh, the works, notice that word, the works of the flesh, but he talks about next the fruit of the spirit. Not, not, not the works, he talks about the fruit of God's, the produce of God's spirit. Look in verse 22, but the, the fruit, the produce of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. And here's what I want us to catch today. Is that that word fruit, it tells us something. It tells us something about how the Spirit works in the life of the believer. That our growth as followers of Jesus is often gradual. Have you ever wanted to speed up the growth process a little bit? Like, come on. I, I, I thank God I'm not where I used to be, but I'm not where I want to be. Let's speed this thing up a little bit. And just as fruit takes time to grow, I mean, so do we. 
We take time to grow. How are you creating this environment to grow? Richard Foster, known for his book, Celebration of Discipline, says that to pray is to change. This is a great grace. How good of God to provide a path whereby our lives can be taken over by love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self control. How great a grace this is in our lives. More often than not, it's my time in prayer and being in the Word that enables the fruit of God's Spirit to come out in my life. I would invite you on Tuesdays, we've been practicing prayer, Tuesdays at noon. A few folks show up here in the auditorium, more folks join online, we live stream that so that you could watch it maybe during a lunch hour or even later that evening or the next day and it's just a, a practicing of this prayer, this centering time. So what's, what's this fruit that the Spirit enables? You'll see on the screen. The, the first is a, agape love. And I, want to, I want you to consider each of these. To serve a person for their intrinsic value, not for what that person brings to you. Maybe I, I use anger to control those around me rather than allow love to console and shepherd those around me. You see the difference? The fruit of God's Spirit. Kara, joy. We sing about that today several times in our worship songs. A delight in God for sheer beauty and worth of who He is. Irene, peace. A confidence in the wisdom and control of God rather than your own. Almost often uses peace to designate reconciliation and unity. Keep the unity of the spirit through what? Through the bond of peace. Macrohumia, patience. An ability to face trouble without blowing up. It is the spirit of God that enables us to become a non-anxious presence in the midst of others. Christotes, kindness, to serve others practically in a way which makes me vulnerable. When I show kindness, I'm, I'm putting myself out there a little bit, right? Uh, what if you went around this week just throwing kindness like confetti? I was at Aldi this past week. I uh, uh, love shopping at Aldi. Uh, you know that Inflation is hit hard when Aldi starts increasing prices, all right? <clears throat> so, I mean, a, a loaf of bread is like 10 cents more at Aldi now, and it's, it's, really, it's, it's really ruffling my feather, feathers a little bit. You know, three cents more for salt and crackers. I, you know, I just I can't handle all that. But anyway, I was outside, and you got to pay, you got to a, give a quarter, right, to get your cart at Aldi. And so I, I step out of the car, and I, I'm walking up to the, you know, all the carts. And <clears throat> you ever, like, start searching your pockets? And then nothing's in there, but, but you just keep searching because you think you're going to find something. <laughs> like you just keep, you know, it's like, surely, surely there's something in there. Like, if I go deep enough, there's a, I'll find a quarter in there somewhere. Well, this, this lady, I'm walking up to the, the carts, and this lady, she comes up real quick and puts her cart up and, and gets her quarter out and starts walking off. And I was like, I'm standing right here. You're like, you could have you given me that cart, you know? And then, but she starts walking off, and I'm sitting there doing the thing in my pockets. I'm like, I know I got a quarter in here somewhere. And I'm just standing there. And that, that sweet lady who I judged, in a, you know, inappropriately, she turned around, she came back, and she gave me her quarter. Can you believe that? I mean, and I, I, said, I said, thank you for your, your kindness, you know. And so when I, when I came out, I gave my card to somebody else, trying to, trying to pay it forward and, and, and all that. But, but th there's this... There's this idea that the Spirit enables this in us. It enables us to, to throw kindness like confetti. I got the sune, goodness, integrity, being the same person in every situation. Do you know people who are the same person in every situation? Pistis, faithfulness, to be utterly reliable and true to your word. Pratis, gentleness, a blend of reserve and strength, the opposite of being superior or self-absorbed. Gratia, self-control. The uh, ability to pursue the important over the urgent, rather to be always impulsive or uncontrolled. 
So the question of the day really becomes how? How? How can the fruit of God's Spirit take root and grow? And, and I want to, to give you just a few potential takeaways in just a moment, but, but Paul then moves, and a lot of times there's, we get into this, this trouble in, in, in the text because there's these chapter breaks. And these chapter breaks weren't put in there originally, they were put in there by, by men hundreds of years later, and so you know, there's sometimes some really bad chapter breaks you know, in, in God's Word. Uh, because it was written as a whole, and, and we need to, to read it as a whole. And so Galatians 5 uh, actually leads into Galatians 6. And in Galatians 6, starting in, in verse 1, the word says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, someone's caught in a sin, that you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourself, or you also, you also may be tempted. Next verse, verse 2. Carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks that he is something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. And verse 4, but let each one test his own work. Each one should test their own actions, it says. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. And then verse 5, for each one should carry their own load. So there's kind of this seems like this opposing statement from, from Paul. It seems like, carry one another's burdens, but carry your own load. So what's, what's he talking about there? Um, when I was younger, I did a few haunted houses. Uh, Tis the season with next week, you know, being Halloween. And I really have no interest in haunted houses anymore. Um, my first haunted house, it really wasn't, really wasn't the, the, the scary stuff that bothered me. Uh, what, what bothered me was we were in this pitch black space and there was a maze and uh, we were, had this large group and, and we were trying to, to navigate the maze and we all at one point got jammed up in the maze. And so we're just sitting there you know, in the maze and just, you know, you can't move, pitch black and the, the claustrophobia starts, you know, settling in a little bit, like, am I ever gonna get, get out of here? And, and that's really what concerned me more than anything. Um, I did get out of the haunted house eventually, so hopefully that was obvious. But um, years later, we, my youth minister, his name was uh, Gary Hill. And so uh, he had some woods out behind his house. And so uh, appropriately, we, we named those, those woods uh, Hell's Haunted Woods, right? Um, H-A-L-E, Hell, right? Uh, and so we, we would have, you know, youth group and other friends and all that. They would come and we would set up the woods and they would walk through the woods and it would be, you know, kind of a, you know, like kind of thing and scary and all that. But I had, I had one student that I knew was just scared to death of this kind of thing. And so uh, w would not go through, you know, the, the, the woods at, at, at any cost, you know. And so I just, I just told him, I said, I said hey, how about this? How about you come early, like when it's daylight? And you and I will just we'll walk through the woods together while it's daylight. And so you can see everything that's going on. And, and then when you come back at, at night, you'll be familiar because you've seen, you know, everything in the daylight. And so the student agreed and we walked through everything. And I showed them, you know, where everything was going to be and all that. And it was, uh, uh, you know, so the student went through, you know, that night and later came out and, and says, you know, Brett, it, it was still really scary. Uh, you know, that didn't, that didn't really do what I thought I was going to do. But I tried. I tried to, like, you know, instill a little bit of confidence in, in that, that student's life. And, and I thought about what, what, what the point of, of that was. When, when it comes to a struggle, we often feel more comfortable addressing that which we can see. So if we bring light to something, we, we, we often feel more comfortable being able to address that. If someone has a cast on their arm or their foot, you know, we'll, we'll often ask them, hey, what happened to your arm? Or, hey, what happened to your foot? We can see that. You know, and so we'll, we'll ask. But what happens in the, the Christian life is a lot of times there's things going on. There's, there's wars that are happening inside of us that, that we can't see in our neighbor. And so when it comes to this, this struggle, we're more apt to, to deal with what we can see. But... But Paul says that if anyone's caught in this burden, if anyone's caught in a transgression, you who are 
led by the Spirit. You who are spiritual should restore that, that person in a spirit of gentleness, but, but keep watch. Be careful, lest you think that you're the one who's doing the restoring. Be careful. It's not you, it's Christ. And so what, which is, is kind of the whole point of Galatians, right? It's, it's Christ alone, not the law, not circumcision. I've been crucified with Christ. Then Paul says to bear one of those burdens or carry one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Paul, Paul connects bearing one another's burdens with fulfilling the law of Christ. And I think we get a little insight to this in Galatians 5, 14, which we read a moment ago. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But how can we bear the suffering of one another if we don't know the suffering of one another? Amen. And so if our mission is to fulfill the law of Christ and our neighbor cannot tell us what's going on and our neighbor's too uncomfortable to share something, then this law of Christ goes unfinished. It goes unfulfilled. Uh, one of the books I read a few years ago was the book Troubled Minds by Amy Simpson and Amy says it this way, the church is supposed to be a community where the hurting, the broken, the sin scarred find rest and redemption, where everyone present owns up to being rescued from the ultimate death, the ultimate suffering by the grace of God, where that same grace causes us to reach outside ourselves and through the Holy Spirit's power to love one another. This is the church as it should be. You who are spiritual, you who are led by the Spirit must step up and step forward to help and love. This refers to those who are indwelt by God's Spirit and who therefore seek to walk by this same Spirit. This is not some kind of measure of spirituality. Like, you know, you're, you're here and I'm up here. That, that's, not, uh, that's not the spirit of what I believe Paul's talking about. Christians are to care for one another as an expression of our relationship with God. I mean, that doesn't mean that there's not times where we need to sit, set loving boundaries in situations that that doesn't mean that there's not times where certain struggles uh, do not, don't need to be broadcasted publicly or recklessly but that does mean that the body of christ takes seriously fulfilling the law of christ this is what i'm going to ask of the homewood family this morning is that we'll make a commitment to one another that no one in this faith family will suffer in silence A few years ago, I was in a cloudy season uh, mentally and emotionally, and cloudy may be a generous term. I had genuine feelings of depression, and some of you have been there. I wasn't clinically diagnosed, uh, but it was real. You know, according to the National Alliance on Mental Illness website, one in five adults in the U.S. experience mental illness each year. One in six students aged six through 17 experience a mental health disorder each year. And the reality of what we know is that, that everyone has mental health, just like everyone has health. Uh, most of us have some type of struggle with our mental health over the course of our lifetime, just like most of us will have some kind of struggle with our physical health over the course of our lifetime. And the season that I personally experienced you know, although it was hard, God has worked to allow me to see others through a different lens because of that. I'm not as quick to judge. I'm not as quick to accept stigmas concerning those who struggle with mental health. Maybe you've heard things like, well, if, if you just had more faith or if you just prayed more or if you, you should just get over it and, and, and move on. Can I just say this morning, if those are responses that you've heard to those struggles, I'm sorry. Even if someone had good intentions in saying those things, my guess is that those comments hurt. And do I believe that God can work in this area? Absolutely I do. I've seen it. I've experienced breakthroughs in my own life. Yet trying to fix someone with these platitudes is rarely helpful and often does more harm than good. So I reflect on, on my granddad who passed away a month before I came on staff here. And my granddad uh, struggled with dementia for several years, last several years of his life. And it's hard to watch a man that you love and respect come to a place where he doesn't even know who you are. 
And I would smile as I left visiting with him, and I would say, I love you, Granddad. And then I would walk out. What I came to learn is that the, the produce of the Spirit enables us to love even when we can't see the produce. Because ultimately the produce is love. It's a reminder to me of our commitment today that no one in this faith family suffer in silence. But if that's going to happen, we have to carry one of those burdens. And in so doing, we fulfill the law of Christ. And according to Christ, his law is love. This is why we talk about small group community. This is why we talk about being in one another's lives, doing life together. Paul says we have to carry our own load at times, and so there's a balance, a balance that requires wisdom and discernment. I'm going to close with kind of these three takeaways. I've told you a moment ago that how, how, how do we begin to see this manifested in our own lives? Uh, three things. One is that we, we need to remember that we belong to Christ. Remember that you belong to Christ. It's one of the reasons that we gather each week. It's one of the reasons that we commune with one another, as John walked us through a moment ago, each week that we remember that we belong to Christ. Verse 24 in chapter 5, those who belong to Christ Jesus, Paul says. Our approval and welcome from the Father rests not on our character or our actions, but His. Amen. Number two is that we need to conform to Christ. Verse 24, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Because Christ has been crucified, those who identify with Him have also been crucified in Him, as Paul says in chapter 2. I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I but Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live in this flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave Himself for me. Scholar David De Silva says, Paul calls for a decisive break with the values, thinking, behaviors, and domination systems of this age, all held together as the cosmos to which the believer is crucified and which is crucified to the believer. To crucify the sinful nature is to say, Lord, my heart thinks that I must have this thing, otherwise I have no value, but to think and feel and live like this is to forget what I mean to you, God says how you see me in Christ. And then number three, we need to remember that we possess the Spirit and that the produce of the Spirit begins with love. Not only is our identity changed when we enter the waters of baptism, but we also have power to live every day by the Spirit. To make no mistake, the Christian life is not just some tug of war where we experience perpetual defeat and, and minimal growth. When we belong to Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit. That very spirit that brought Jesus back to life is still in the resurrection business today. And so, as Paul encouraged the Galatians, may you and I be persuaded to return to the full, complete gospel that he had given them instead of embracing this false message. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Rather, let us keep in step with the spirit the spirit whose produce begins with love. Let's pray. Father, we're reminded this morning that a spirit-formed and spirit-prompted person is measured by loving you and loving others. We thank you for this great gift, this gift of grace, that through your Holy Spirit, the fruit that manifests itself in our lives can bless and serve others. And so we pray that today that we will once again put off the works of the flesh so that we can embrace the fruit of your Holy Spirit. So we pray, come Holy Spirit, fill our hearts and kindle them in the fire of your love. God, we're so thankful for your gospel of grace. that has changed our lives forever. It's in Jesus' good name that we pray.
If you have a need this morning, if you'd like to pray with one of our shepherds, or maybe you want to meet in a more private setting, you can go back to, to this room to my right, the chapel, or you can come down front and meet with one of our shepherds today. If today is the day you want to be baptized into Christ, we'd love to celebrate that with you. You can come down front as well. Let's stand and sing this morning.